joining me on the Navarra Media Orange Sofa is author and essayist Edouard Louis. And to really hammer the point home, we are here in uh, Topshop, um, just in case you didn't pick up on the visual cue. So thank you so thank much you. for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, and it's because it was a phrase that really stuck with me, or a question that stuck with me in your writing, which is, is it normal to feel ashamed of loving someone? Mm -hmm. And I thought in a very pure way, it got to the problem of solidarity, which is what happens to love when you throw dispossession and mistrust into the mix. Can you tell me a bit about how that question emerged for you? Yeah, you know, because in my, in my books, I, I, I write about uh, poor people, dispossessed people, uh, from the north of France, uh, the region where I, where I grew up. Uh, I, I grew up in a small village that used to be an industrial village in the 70s, 80s, and suddenly all the factories started to close and people were jobless and, and hopeless and, and moneyless and everything. And when you suffer that much, it's, it's kind of difficult to create room for love in your life, you know? We all experience, in a way, in, uh, you know, in, in our everyday life, all of us experience that. Sometimes you have a bad day at work, you suffered for something you know, bad, you had an experience that you didn't like, and you go home and you are mean with the person that you love, you know? and you understand that it, this violence that you express doesn't really belong to you, you know? that it was a, a, a violence that was crossing your body, you know? that you didn't own. And uh, so sometimes the violence that we express is not belonging to us. You know? we, we can carry a violence that it's not hours, you know? And so when you are exposed to constant violence and constant social violence, like the poor people are, like working class or post-working class are, it's extremely difficult not to be, not to be tensed. And the story of my father and of my mother is a story of people who had to struggle with so many difficulties, with so many problems, with so many issues, that it was very difficult to say, I love you to the home children, you know? So I'm trying really to understand that, you know, how, what is the room for love when your life is made out of uh, suffering and, 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 and problems, yeah. So your essay, Why My Father Votes for Le Pen, turns into almost a detective novel, which is Who Killed My Father? And I thought that that shift was really interesting. Can you tell us a bit about your father and what his story is and why you're so interested in telling it? So yeah, my, my father grew up in a, in a small village in the north of France uh, where I grew up and my grandfather was living there, my grandmother, my grand-grandmother, my grand-grandfather and no one would uh, escape this place. My father, like everyone in his family, stopped school at uh, 14 or 15 years old and he went straight to the factory to work to, uh, as a factory worker and as I say in the book in Who Killed My Father, when he was 35 he had an accident as a factory that completely destroyed his body and he had to stay in bed for four years. And um, what I suddenly figured out when I started to think about my father, when I started to want to write about his life, was to see how much, like, how strongly politics was involved in the story uh, of his body and in the story of his flesh, on, on, on the story of who he is, you know. And so I wrote a book about his life, about his trajectory, about his body that would involve the history of politics, of French politics in the last uh, 30 years, you know. And it was in quite a literal way. I think one of the phrases that you used was, you know, Jacques Chirac ruined my father's intestines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, because what I, what I try to show in, in, in Who Killed My Father is that um, for someone like my father, a political decision made uh, by uh, Chirac or made by Sarkozy or by Macron is uh, as intimate for him as his first kiss or as the first time he made love, you know, when Jacques Chirac started to uh, stop reimbursing some medicine, you know. One day, Jacques Chirac took a decision to stop paying for medicine for poor people and suddenly my father couldn't buy the medicine. Uh, so he was, he was in pain, you know, he was suffering because of that. And so this pain was something deeply intimate, you know. And so what I really try to show in the book is it's exactly that. And, and furthermore, I really believe that the more you are uh, dominated, socially speaking, in the social structure, and the more you are exposed to politics, you know, 
today I can say that I don't like Macron because I don't like his violence. I don't like the political violence in, in France today. But Macron, he can't take food out of my mouth, you know. He can't, he can't really do anything to my body. But for my father, or for a migrant, for example, the decision of Macron to welcome or not to welcome a migrant means, am I, go am I going to die in the sea, you know? Am I going to drown? Is my sister, is my brother, is my father, is my son going to die in the sea, you know? And so the more you are excluded in the world we live in, and the more we are, you are exposed to politics, and politics doesn't mean the same thing depending on like which part of the world do you belong to, you know? And, and, and really so, for me to, to, to talk about the length of politics within the uh, working class uh, is to really talk about their lives because people like my father are exposed to that political violence uh, all the time. I mean, what I found really interesting is that on the left, we tend to use the word violence in quite a metaphorical sense. So we talk about the violence of language or we talk about, you know, microaggressions. Whereas in your work, you talk about violence, vulnerability and suffering in a very, very visceral way. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me in thinking about the connections between Who Killed My Father and The End of Eddie is that you do explore in unflinching detail, the humiliation of men. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's got something to do in a broader sense with where France and perhaps Europe more generally finds itself politically? Yeah, I, you know, I mean that the, the truth of what we call politics is the border between people who are exposed to a premature death and people whose bodies are protected and people whose lives and bodies are privileged, you know. In France today, if you're a working class man or a working class woman, you have 50 more percent chance uh, to die before 65 year, uh, years old, you know. Uh, if you are a queer person, you have uh, four times more chance to commit a suicide when you are a child or when you are a teenager. If you're a person of color, you can be killed by the police, uh, like uh, uh, Adama Traoré was uh, two years ago in France. So. Or the humiliation, right, which sort of um, spearheaded the whole Justice Porteo yeah, uh, movement, is that it was such a, a public humiliation and, and violation of the body. Yeah, because this humiliation is part of this, um, this mechanism and, and, and this system of persecution. The fact that in our societies, some bodies are persecuted, you know, by, by politics. And in fact, it's very bizarre because, you know, I write about working class, I write about poor people. And very often when people talk about uh, poor people, they talk about excluded people. They talk about exclusion. And, and exclusion is a word that you often hear in, in, in politics, in the media and everything. But when I think about people like my father, uh, he was not uh, excluded. He was uh, persecuted, mm -hmm. you know. Politicians were obsessed with people like my father. They would say all the time they have to work harder, they have to study harder, mm -hmm. they are responsible for what they are, they have to get less welfare, they have to work more, you know. And so the history of the poor people or working class or nomad of the world uh, uh, in Europe is a story of a persecution, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's even more true if you're a person of color, you know, because mm -hmm. in France, if you're black, if you're an Arab person, you can be uh, arrested by the police for nothing, you can be killed by the police for nothing, you can be raped by the police for nothing. And, and, and so I, I, really, I really wonder if we, uh, if we should maybe uh, change the word exclusion with the word persecution, because it's when you have privilege, it's when you have money mm -hmm. that you can exclude yourself from your society. You so know? do you think that the appeal of Le Pen and of this insurgent far right is that they offer the permission to persecute another group more than you're being persecuted? Mm -hmm. Or is it actually genuinely a hopeful project where they think the nation will deliver for me? No, I think it's, uh, you are right. I think it's part of it. It's part of a, a kind of like survival mechanism to put other people under you, you know. So for the white working class that my father or my mother belonged to, uh, they, by voting for the National Front, by voting for the far right, they put some people under them, you know. They, they feel, they think that they are doing it. Uh, but it also, it's also due to the history of uh, French and, and European politics and the fact that a huge part uh, of the so-called left, 
of the institutional left, the SPD in Germany, the Labour uh, in, in the UK, uh, the Soci Parti Socialist in France, progressively in the 70s, 80s, they, start, they stopped uh, talking about poor people, they stopped talking about poverty, they stopped talking about pain, they stopped talking about work, and more and more they talked about responsibility, they talked about going back to work, they talked about effort, they talked about gestion, and so, so many people, like my father and my mother, they suddenly felt that they were not represented by the left anymore. And so there was a massive movement from the left to the far right, because suddenly people were saying, and my father during my childhood was always saying, uh, the far right is the only party talking about us, they are the only one talking about our bodies. They are. So it was awful, of course, to vote for. Of course, there were some people who were deeply racist and everything, and some people who will never change on that regard. But I, I tr truly believe that a huge part of these people in my childhood, like my father, who were voting for the far right. If they had a strong left fighting for them, they would have voted for the left. Let's, you know, prod and probe at this a little bit more because one of the things that I'm constantly turning around in my own head is what is the relationship between left populism and anti-racism? Because for me, first and foremost, my politics are anti-racist because I also I saw directly what happened to my mum and how mm. she was treated by our racist neighbours. They mm. would, you know, shit and piss all over the door just to watch her clean it up. And, and there was something about the bodiliness of that humiliation uh -huh. that, that stuck with me and motivated me. And now in the UK, the left are this close to power. And all that the right has in order to discredit the left is identity politics. You're obsessed with identity politics and making it a big culture war. There are some socialists who would say, if the left want to win power and to deliver a better economic future for everyone. They've got to then stay away from anything that could be interpreted as identity politics. So don't be so noisy about anti-racism, shut up about queer and trans people. Why are you going on about Me Too? What do you think about that? I really, I, I really believe, like uh, as, as the French philosopher Didier Ribon said, that uh, the border between politics and identity politics, between class politics and identity politics, uh, is a lie. Uh, I, I, I don't see any difference. You know, when you are fighting for people's life, when you are fighting for people's bodies, uh, what's the difference between class and identity? You know, to be exposed to premature death because you are working class man, or to be exposed to premature death because you are a black woman, it's the same thing. At the end, is your your, your body is precarious. You know, and what precisely what I try to show uh, in in my book, Who Killed My Father, is that. The, the links between um, masculinity and class and, and what we call identity um, uh, doesn't really exist because, for example, someone like my father during his whole childhood to, in order to build his masculinity and he had no choice, he had to build his masculinity or other people would have excluded him and called him faggots like they did with me during my childhood. In order to build his masculinity, he had to exclude himself from the school system as young as he could, you know, because to, to, to perform the, 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 the fact of refusing to obey the teacher, the fact of disobeying, to refuse the authority from the school system was, was, was a way of performing masculinity. So because of the masculine domination and because of the obsession with masculinity in our society, my father stopped school very young and because of that he didn't have any diplomas and because of that he had very bad jobs in his life that were very badly paid, not bad as such, I, I don't believe that a job is better than another one, but they were so badly paid and he had to work so so much. And so I say, I say in the book that the, 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 the economical poverty of my father is due to masculinity in a way, not completely, but in, 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 a, in a huge part. So we see with this example that the, the border and the difference between identity politics and class politics and economy uh, is an illusion, you know? And it's really what I try to do in my books. I really try to find um, a contemporary way of talking about class. I, I, I think we really need that. We really need to, we really need, sorry, to, to reinvent the, the, the language about society, about class, about violence, about domination, because so many people are talking the same way uh, the Communist Party was talking in the 50s, and it's not possible, as you were, uh, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, in 2017, from a UK perspective, looking at the French elections, it was being reported in the media that Macron single-handedly had defeated the far right forever and ever, amen, job done. And then 
What we see with Gilets Jaunes is this real insurgent energy, ostensibly over fuel tax, but I think there's a lot more going on besides. Mm -hmm. And even when Macron backs down on issues like I think minimum wage and the, and, and the fuel tax, the insurgent energy didn't go away. What the hell is going on? <laughs> uh, a beautiful thing, which is that people are revolting against everything they suffered from, and people are finally saying, I suffer, you know. I think that saying, I suffer, is one of the most difficult things uh, in our world, in our society. People in my childhood, people like my father or my mother that I, that I describe in my life, they were suffering from poverty, from exclusion, from humiliation all the time, you know. My mother wanted to work and my father would tell her a woman should stay home. And, and, but she, when she was talking about her life, she would always say, oh, but it's okay, it could be worse, you know. So I was always thinking, why does she say I suffer? What, why, why is she ashamed? Why, why is she afraid of saying I suffer? And for me, what we call a social movement, what we call a political moment, is a moment in which people finally feel safe to say I suffer, you know? Because there is a constant mechanism in the public sphere to make people shut up, you know? There is a, a mediatic effort, a, a bourgeois effort, a class effort to make the people who suffer shut about their life, about, about what they feel and everything. One of the word of it, one of the phenomena of it is the people who, who talk about victimization, you know? As if the problem in our society was that too many people were saying, I am a victim, you know? For me, if I do a diagnostic of our society, the problem is the opposite. It's like, since so many people, because they are people of color, because they are queer people, because they are working class people, so many people are suffering, why is it so difficult to say, I suffer, I was a victim of something, mm. which doesn't mean I am only a victim mm. and only that and forever and ontologically, but why is it so difficult? So victimization, like many other words, is a strategy in order to say to people, shut up, don't talk about what you suffer, don't talk about what you, and, and, and literature or social movements can, if they, if they do it well, they can offer space for people to talk about themselves and, and, and to free themselves. I mean, I like the idea of literature and the social movement being these sort of <laughs> mirror forms in which you can, you can uh, articulate the self. And that's something which I think, finally, because otherwise I'm going to get yelled at for taking up all your time, <laughs> that I want to ask you, which is your work to me sits between you know, this triangle of art and sociology and memoir. And now because you've achieved a degree of success, that lots of people are talking about your work, they're, you know, praising your work, you're moving in these very, very bourgeois spaces. Do you ever feel that there's this form of co-option going on and that the nature of publishing in the literary world automatically, you know, renders impotent the radical potential of a work like like yours, which is you know supposed to be confronting society. No, you know, at some point when I when I escaped from my childhood and when I escaped from the village of my childhood and I arrived in Paris and was the first in my family to study and I would see the bourgeoisie, my dream was to be like them, you know, because I felt so intimidated by them. They would talk about the travels they were doing when they were children. They would talk about the opera or the theater plays that they saw with their parents and I had nothing to do with them. And my dream was to be like them. But I was lucky because in a way they never accepted me because I didn't come from the same milieu, I didn't have the same past with them. And they always made me understand that I, was, I will never be like them, you know? A little bit like in, in the masterpiece from uh, Alan Hollinger's mm. The Line of Beauty, in which you have this outsider uh, arriving like this in a very bourgeois milieu. And this bourgeoisie always remind him, you know, you are part of us, but not completely. And in fact, the bourgeoisie, the dominant class, no matter the word, once again, they don't realize that they build weapons against them, you know? Because of course, it, I think it was natural when I was 17, 18, to, to be willing to be, to be like them, to, to, to look like them and everything. But because they always made me understand that I was not like them, they, they built a, a weapon against themselves. And now when I write, I always think like, how can I challenge the dominant class? How can I feel make, uh, how can I make feel them bad uh, uh, about what they do, about what they don't do, about their responsibility in this bad world in which we live in, you know? And um, so um, exclusion can be sometimes a good thing. Like I was, I was lucky not to be 
assimilated, uh, if we can say so in English, to, to that milieu. I mean, it's sort of a strange parallel to Fanon's experience mm -hmm. when he goes from Martinique to Paris and he has this moment of realization that he will never be mm -hmm. French because Absolutely. he is black. Yeah. And then that's what, you know, sets off the whole, you know, chain of realization and exploration that becomes black skins, white masks. Mm -hmm. So just a very quick thing, things that you want our viewers to read. Sorry? Things that you want our viewers to read, things that works that mean a lot to you. Oh. <laughs> I, w I would suggest to read uh, Franz Fanon, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, who was very important for me in my thinking, and also Pierre Bourdieu mm -hmm. and Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir and, and Marguerite Duras and Toni Morrison <laughs> and, and so many people, Ocean Vuong, so many people that I, I admire deeply. And also because these people are really dealing with uh, what we are experiencing in our lives, in our societies, in the reality we evolve in. And uh, you know there was a kind of, of, of strange ideology in the literary field in Europe uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, which was the more you were far from reality, the more you were far from society, racism, homophobia, real concern, class issues and everything, and, and the more you were considered a literary person, the more your literature was considered serious. And what I try to do when I write, and what I try to do when I write uh, O Kill My Father, but my other books also, is try to really undo this uh, ideology, and I truly believe that the people that I just quoted um, were part of this struggle because often literature is a, is a tool from the dominant class, from the bourgeoisie that does that change nothing to our world, you know. And 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 if you want to go to do good literature, you have to fight against literature. When Toni Morrison was writing literature, she was writing against literature because at that time. Literature was a white thing by white people, for white people, about white bodies, about white stories. And uh, she said, I'm going to write the story of a black woman from the point of view of a black woman. And so I always say to people, I always say, don't love literature too much. And that's the condition in order to do good literature. I like it. It's kind of this Gramscian approach of like within <laughs> and against the novel. Absolutely. Exactly. Edouard, thank you thank so you. much Thanks for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>